Let's talk about the Millennial Temple. Um, the last nine chapters of the book of Ezekiel are a real enigma to many people. In fact, it almost didn't make it into the canon. And yet there's some strange things. The Levites are trivial. The sons of Zadok are bigger. And there's also this mysterious guy, the prince, who is he? He has genealogy and he has offspring. Who is that? And uh, there's a lot of questions that it still raises, nevertheless. But, but um, the, uh, so the, we're going to look at the description of the Millennial Temple. I'm going to suggest that it's highly detailed, so it's not simply symbolic, okay? The topography of the region is totally altered from what it is today. And uh, so we're going to find a lot of interesting... All nations will worship there. That makes sense. But do you know that the, temp the temple is not open on Sunday? It's only open on Shabbat, Saturday, and the new moon. That's going to... That's one of the things the Seventh-day Adventists probably have correct. The offerings and sacrifices are resumed, and that shocks a lot of people. Why is there offerings? For the same reason you had offerings in the Old Testament. The offerings in the Old Testament were anticipatory pointers to the cross. These are memorial of what the cross, the whole universe is judged by that cross that was erected in Judea some 2,000 years ago. And of course it's only open on Sabbath day and new moons as I've mentioned. So let's take a look at the tabernacle to get a perspective here. I'm putting west at the top and east at the bottom. It's a conventional way of representing this. And of course we have, it's about, the original tabernacle was about, and, about 75 feet wide and 150 feet long in rough terms. If, and as my, my uh, British friends remind me, if God wanted us on the metric system, he would have had 10 disciples. So I'm, I'm going to use the English system here. All right. But... Um, if you take the perimeter of that, it happens to be the length of Noah's Ark, and I don't know what you do with that information, but we'll move on. As you enter the one door, outside you just see righteousness, white, but if you enter, you come to the uh, altar of sacrifice. A little further you have the laver to wash. This was the original tabernacle. And then we have the, the now the, the uh, temple proper, if you will, the building, a portable building designed for mobility, inside of which there was the... Uh, uh, menorah to the left and the table of showbread to the right. In the head of you was the golden altar, the altar of incense. Through a veil you again entered the Holy of Holies, which had the Ark of the Covenant, and on top of it a separate item called the mercy seat. It's always mentioned separately. If we zero in on that for its architecture, it's pretty straightforward. We have the holy place being the main space, and then the Holy of Holies, the inside space. And we have the menorah to the left, and we have the table of showbread to the right, and we have the golden altar, and, and then the head of the veil. And then inside the Holy of Holies, we have the Ark of the Covenant, and a separate entity on top of it called the Mercy Seat. And uh, the, um, boy, we could spend the whole weekend on the topics of just these items, but I'll spare you that, because you can dig that out on your own. But Jesus made a claim to be each one of these. He says, I am the door. Anybody that enters by me is a thief and a robber. He says, I am the light of the world. I am the bread of life. He makes intercession for us. He's our sin bearer. And he's also the propitiation for our sins. So he's t connected to every detail. Um, even the sockets, the thing rests on our silver, the, which is redemption. The silver of redemption and so forth. Every, every piece of material, every color, points to Jesus Christ. It's one of the richest studies you can undertake to really get into the behind that. But of course that tabernacle gets replaced by a permanent structure by Solomon called this the, uh, uh, the Solomon's Temple. And it gets destroyed by the Babylonians and it is later rebuilt under Zerubbabel, which is what people call the Second Temple. But it's a pretty meager representation of the previous one, so Herod in a way to try to raises his ratings. He rebuilt, he remodels the whole thing. We still call it the second temple. You and I would tend to call it the third, but the academic nomenclature is just a, an expansion and modernization of the, of the Zerubbabel temple. That's Herod's temple. The Ark of the Covenant was not in there, by the way. That's another whole thing to get into. But uh, again, we have the same kind of architecture as the tabernacle all the way through this. And we uh, have the holy place, except we have more of them in Solomon's temple. We have an inner court, we have the Holocaust altar, we have the molten sea and for washing, the lavers of bronze, and then an outer court. So it has similar but expanded representations of what was the original tabernacle. 
But we have some other things going on in here. We have a thing called the porch, which has been added. And that has all kinds of spiritual significance. And if you really want to get into this, you want to see my wife's book, uh, The Way of Agape and Be Transformed, because the, the, she really develops the spiritual application of all of these things. And you have the wooden uh, storerooms around that where the priests hid their own private things. And that's where they hid their idols and so forth. And we have these two pillars that don't hold up anything. They're symbolically Yachin and Boaz in, the, in, the, in his counsel and his strength and so forth. Personal stories for the priest. These all have implications in our own architecture. And my wife has developed that in uh, phenomenal ways. So I encourage you to take a look at that. But let's talk about Ezekiel because his, his uh, patterning is pretty much uh, very similar. And I'm laying it on his side because it's going to be easier for us to draw it that way. Uh, so I've shifted it a little bit. But again, we have the, the, uh, the uh, chambers for the singers identified. And we have uh, the uh, priest chambers identified. And uh, we have the priest's kitchens. Uh, boy, they love to eat. So in any ways, it's pretty cool. And uh, g expanding this further, we have the inner gates. And then we have a thing called the outer gates. And one of the things you need to understand, there are passages in the kingdom from heaven which have to do with people that are excluded from the wedding feast, forcibly. And they're cast in the outer darkness. And that's a mistranslation of the Greek. It's a very strange construction of the Greek. They, it's, uh, the, the imagery that's being portrayed there is the imagery of the house of God, but you're not in the presence of the Shekinah. So you can be in God's house, but not in the place of illumination, if you will in the darkness that's outside, in effect. And strange as it may seem, uh, that's, that is the, con uh, the consensus of the experts. We have chambers of the outer court, and we have people's kitchens in the corners, and we have the outer gates, and we have the darkness that's outside. That's not, that's not Hades, as we often jump to that conclusion. Um, it's a very strange Greek translation or the darkness that's outside. That's 23 times in the Septuagint translation. And it's a very controversial rendering here. The Greek term skotos is re literally the shadow or darkness. It's a relative term. It's the outside place. It's a comparative adjective, which means exo, outside. More accurately rendered, it's the darkness further away, implying a place that entails lesser illumination than places closer in. That's the flavor of the Greek. It's a very strange construction. Septuagint employs this over 20 times in the final chapters of Ezekiel, which particularly deals with the Millennial Temple. And so the darkness further away is the way the International Standard Version Bible has it. Not just any darkness, but darkness that is outside some specific region of light is the concept from G.H. Lang. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Don't confuse that with hell. That's a classic Hebrew expression of extreme disappointment. Weeping and gnashing of teeth is not necessarily soteriological. It's just extreme disappointment. And there apparently going to be some people that are go not going to be able to be participants at the wedding supper that are really upset about it. And so, this is denial of privileged access, so it's frustration, disappointment, yet no mention of torment or anything like that. There's an inability to cope with this. The situation is not necessarily permanent, by the way. So this is a very controversial point of view. Darkness outside is not hell. Thayer which is one of the experts in the Greek-English lexicon, agrees with this. Kenneth Wiest, in his expanded translation of Greek New Testament, a major, major, pivotal authority, agrees with what I was telling you. Spirozoides, his, uh, his complete word study of the New Testament, agrees with this. The International Standard Version Bible leans on this pretty strongly. That's where I got most of my counsel here. Warren Wearsby, his uh, expositional commentary. Charles Stanley. Edward Lutzer, the head of Moody also agrees, and uh, there are other experts too. Joseph Dillo is one of the first to highlight this in his Reign of the Servant Kings. G.H. Lang and Ed, A. Edward Il Wilson are the authorities here. So this is not a fringe point of view. In fact, it's the most enlightened uh, of, the, of the bona fide experts here. I say that because I'm on the review committee for the ISV, and that's where I really got into all of this. Mm -hmm.